friends, this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Friends, it is Memorial Day. And I don't know if you knew this, but in our sanctuary, we have two wonderful placards with our veterans from the First and Second World War. So as we pause to celebrate this weekend, may we remember our own SCC folks who made the ultimate sacrifice for us. As we continue on with our announcements, I'd like to remind you that we have a garage sale upcoming and that there's lots of good stuff up for grabs. If you or your family can volunteer some of your time on June 4th or June 5th, please reach out to Lucy Werner, who is collecting volunteers. We will have art, we will have jewelry, we will have clothing, we will have sports equipment, and we will have furniture. So if there's anything that you need for the summer, come and check us out. Um, help set up on July 4th, sorry, June 4th, and then come to the sale on June 5th. And now I am here in the choir room to say thank you to our wonderful section leaders. This will be the last weekend that they will be recording new music for us until the fall. And so we are very grateful for them lending our talents. Um, there is an announcement about the section leaders in our e-news. I invite you to have a look at that. And friends, finally, to round out our announcements, I'd like to remind you that book group is on hiatus until the fall, but we are still having our seeking meditation at 2 p.m. on Thursdays and our prayer group at 7 p.m. on Thursdays. All are welcome to join. And upcoming in the summer when we have our in-person worship, our reunion, our reunion, as Reverend Joya has taught us, um, there will be an opportunity on three Sundays in the month of June for our church school children to get together. We will be playing Quidditch, we will be painting stones for our garden, and we will be planting some pollinator plants around the campus to beautify. So friends, we really invite you to participate in that. Don't forget to RSVP for our in-person worship. We need it for contact tracing, so either please send me an email or use the Sign Up Genius. Friends, we are coming back together at long last. It will only be two short weeks before we are able to be together, but I really do encourage you to come out for the garage sale on June 5th and then to stay home on June 6th. There will not be in-person worship because it will be our wonderful, wonderful Children's Sunday and the children are running the service from top to bottom from start to finish and it will be really remarkable They've been working super hard. So friends, I'd like to invite you to now please come with me to worship our God
Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's so good to be with you. I hope everybody is doing okay. And I hope you're enjoying this Memorial Day weekend, this holiday weekend. You know, Memorial Day weekend is always such a special time. Do you know why? Because we remember that summer's coming in just a few weeks. And what does that mean? It means school is going to end. What a year this has been. What a school year this has been. We will remember this year for a long time. Not only has this year been so hard for children and for families and for administrators, this has been a hard year for teachers. Now might be a good time to remember how hard teachers have worked this year, how many sacrifices they've made, how much they've done to support children all over this, this state, this country, and this world. You know, teaching is so important, and it's such a powerful force in the world. Jesus, in today's scripture, talks about teaching. It's another story when he's saying goodbye to his, to his friends, to his disciples, for the last time before he goes up to heaven. So he's going to leave them forever. So he's choosing his words wisely. And one of the last things he tells them is, I want you to become teachers. I want you to teach people about God and faith and how to love. He says, I taught you those things and now it's time for you to teach other people. You know, teachers, do so much. They don't even just give us information. They support us. They guide us. They give us the tools to be able to do things on our own. And that's kind of like what Jesus did. When we have the tools to do things on our own, then guess what? We become teachers. You know, I think about teaching a lot these days because Gael is now two and a half, just over two and a half, and she has a lot to learn. She needs to learn how to speak, and she needs to learn how to behave, and she has a lot to learn. So I find myself teaching her all the time in all sorts of ways. And of course, it makes me appreciate teachers so much more because I see how tiring that is. But it also makes me realize that I do it out of love. That one of the best ways to love people is to teach. I hope this week we can all find a moment or two to teach somebody something as an expression of God's love. Let us pray. Holy and life-giving God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for this special Memorial Day weekend as we anticipate the beginning of summer. And God, today we give our deepest thanks and appreciation for all the teachers in our lives for our teachers at school, for our teachers at home, for everybody that guides us along our way. And God, today we also give thanks that you have called us to be teachers. And we hope that you will inspire us and empower us to love other people the way you love us. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray all these things. Amen. All right, friends, I now invite you to say with me the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who is in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen today's reading is from isaiah 6 verses 1 through 13. in the year that king Uzziah died i saw the lord sitting on a throne high and lofty and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go out for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me.
Today's reading is from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age.
Friends, these past couple of weeks have been an exciting time in ministry for me. I've had one of my wonderful experiences of a full life cycle of events. On Saturday, May 22nd, I got to baptize a beautiful young baby. On Sunday of the following weekend, which is today, the day that we're worshiping, I get to marry a young couple from this church, Scott Harper and Megan Kramer. And tomorrow we will collectively and corporately mourn the loss of all of the people who have given their lives to serve in this country or for this country. Birth and marriages and graduations and deaths, they are happening all around us all the time. And it helps me to remember that even when we have faced multiple, multiple tragedies over the past year and a half in this country, life goes on. Life goes on and we must learn from what we've experienced to be able to move forward. This is also the last time that I am recording a sermon in this space completely by myself. Going forward, starting on June 13th, you will be in here with me to hear me preach if you are able to join us. Please don't forget to RSVP. There will remain an online option for the months of June, July, and August. And in September, we are hoping to roll out a wonderful hybrid option so that we can worship all together once again in a way that feels close knit like the body of Christ is supposed to feel. So even though this past week has been trying, I feel hope. I hope that you will feel hope too. Please join with me in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks this day for the many cycles in our lives. We know that we have had joy and that we have had despair. We ask that you give us the hope that it takes to stand up for injustice when we witness it so that we can truly be your hands and feet here on this earth for the duration of our lives. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. I would be remiss if I didn't say that this past week has carried a lot of weight for the fight for racial injustice in America. Because this past Tuesday was one year since millions of us sat glued to our TVs and computer screens, witnessing the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police officers in Minneapolis. And this coming week also marks the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. And while we may not see the daily protests and demonstrations that we saw this past summer, we do not want to lose momentum in the fight against racism in America. And because this past week and current week provide momentous anniversaries, I've spent extra time reflecting on my texts for this week. And for those who say that what was written in the past has no bearing or no meaning or no relevance for the present, I offer you the words of the prophet Samuel from this week's reading from Isaiah. Samuel said, woe is me, I am lost for I am a person of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips and yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then I watched as one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed you and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the very voice of God saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I was able to answer, here am I God, send me. Now, I got to tell you, I wish I was as brave as the prophet Samuel. I wish that I had survived a painful experience in my life and that I could act with enough faith in the living God that when God asks whom should be sent, even in the midst of suffering, I was able to answer, here am I, God, send me. Now, we have witnessed a lot of activists, many activists born out of suffering in this past year. And again, I wish I had been braver. But I've spent most of my life being conflict avoidant, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. However, we have come to a place in our nation's history where we can no longer fear speaking the truth in love, no matter the cost. Because learning to speak truth to people 
is something that can be gradually developed over time. It's like working a muscle over and over to make it stronger. You have to first cultivate the ability to confront hard topics. Sometimes you start with small questions. Sometimes you start with small steps. You point out problems. You become engaged. Becoming engaged is always the first step. Then you move that you can play. You move to more of a significant role by pointing out problems. You move to a more significant role by offering alternative perspectives, whether those perspectives are popular or not. And over time, I admit that I've become a bit more courageous in my preaching and my activism. Because now when I fear, when I see, and um, I am aware of a significant moral failure, I am learning to speak the truth and call out the injustice in a wise and gracious manner. But I need to work on my ability to speak in acute situations. Now, I know that I have mentioned a lot of these things in my sermons but I don't feel as though I've really gotten to the root of the issue. And this is work that I feel that this congregation is really called to do. If there's anything that this double pandemic of racial injustice and COVID-19 has taught me over the past year, it's that a culture that tolerates this type of abuse and mistreatment of historically underrepresented groups, this culture is very hard to eradicate. And it's much harder to eradicate than the leaders of this country suppose. The rabid inequality in this nation has been laid bare in real time over this past year. And sadly, there's a sort of complacency and willing disregard in tolerating this culture of abuse. We see it to this present day. And we may have a new administration, and while that gives me hope, this work is not done, far from it. It's hardly just begun. We have a lot of learning and growing to do as a country, as a congregation, as a people of unclean lips. So to prepare for my sermon this week, I listened to a bunch of radio programs and podcasts. I read an awful lot of articles. And I was struck by the words of someone who serves in a community in Tulsa. I listened to an NPR interview where Anna Garcia Navarro interviewed the Reverend Robert R.A. Turner, who is the pastor at the historic Vernon AME Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Reverend Turner stated, in Tulsa, we have the worst example of a racial massacre in American history. And nobody, no one, was ever indicted or arrested or charged with any crime in relation to the Tulsa massacre. And so, it hit a little differently, and it was a bit refreshing to see the Derek Chauvin verdict. But even with that verdict, we know that there are still police officers, and there are several countless cases across America of police officers who have not been charged. And the Tulsa massacre is perhaps the biggest example. So I have to ask, with the bravery that I have been given in this life, don't you think a hundred years later, it is high time that someone is called to account for these heinous acts? Most, if not all of the perpetrators are dead, but the survivors are not. And several of them testified before Congress this past week about the horrors and atrocities that they witnessed. In a conversation that we had this past Sunday on May 23rd about the next steps in our congregation's ongoing sacred conversations about race and racism, Reverend Joya reminded us that this work is ongoing, that we can't have a couple of weeks session and feel like we've figured out the problem and it's solved. We need to plant a seed and cultivate it as it grows in us and in this congregation because this is work that we are called to do. And also during that conversation, Reverend Joya reminded me of something that theologian Howard Thurman once wrote in his seminal work, Jesus and the Disinherited. In Jesus and the Disinherited, Thurman depicted Jesus as a poor member of an ethnic minority living in a colony of the Roman Empire. But Jesus was never afraid. Jesus wasn't afraid to speak directly to the oppressed, and Jesus wasn't afraid to speak directly to the oppressor. That's a really important message for this day. And not only did Jesus speak with disinherited people, 
Jesus preached against the temptations of fear, deception, and hatred with a message of dignity for all of God's people. But most of all, Jesus preached love. And Thurman says, love of the enemy means that a fundamental attack must first be made on the enemy status. The privileged and the underprivileged must meet in places without hierarchy in order to overcome it. You know what? Howard Thurman goes on to say that the experience of common worship is such a moment. So don't tell me that a book that was written 2,000 years ago doesn't have any relevance for today. We have an opportunity every single week to sing a song of protest and love and of dignity and worth for all of God's people. And Howard Thurman was writing this in the late 1940s from San Francisco of all places where he was the co-pastor of the Church of the Fellowship of All People. It was one of the first and remains to this day one of the few self-consciously integrated churches in the country. And this small church was founded to demonstrate a vision of an integrated future, a beloved community that Thurman hoped would one day come to pass. If Howard Thurman had been alive in this past year, I know he would have seen some of the good that had happened through the COVID pandemic, the good of people helping other people. But I wonder how shocked and how saddened Howard Thurman would have been to see his message and Dr. King's message and the message, frankly, of the entire civil rights movement and the message, frankly, of the prophet Samuel to feel so distant from many of our national conversations about race and racism. It's high time to think about the implications of our sacred conversations on race and racism in the contemporary church. So can we, through our sermons, our ministry, and our proclamation of all kinds, communicate the reality of God's power and glory and holiness and love to a world that considers the church irrelevant? You know, today is Trinity Sunday, and I always, always fear preaching on this day because the concept of the Trinity is so dang hard to explain. But the concept of the Trinity means that the church is fundamentally all about relationship. That God, the creator, created. That Jesus, the redeemer, redeemed. And the Holy Spirit is still here to sustain us as the sustainer. When we ask our triune God for help, we cause folks to realize that we need all aspects of God so that we can function in this world and the relationship between the creator, redeemer, and sustainer and us insists that what relationship is, is what really matters. Relationship becomes the litmus test for what faith can look like in the world. And relationship can also be a rather inconvenient truth about God, especially for those who use God simply as a vehicle for their own power. Relationship and shared power, it doesn't translate well to absolutism. The imbalance of empower in this world is the reason that we have racism, and in fact, it's the reason that we have all of the isms in the first place. So my challenge to us is for us to glimpse what life can be like if relationship is at the heart of who we are and who this church strives to be. An expectation that we experience the love of God in relationships that are good and whole will help us to be a just congregation going forward. A congregation that is loving and above all equal. It's a hope that in the end, God will help us to achieve the unity that God has wanted us to have from day one. The unity that Jesus spent his entire ministry preaching about. Maybe then, if we all make it our daily work, we won't have the isms. And as it is Memorial Day weekend, perhaps we can even dream of a world without war. So let's choose to be brave enough to volunteer when God is calling us to do tough work in this hurting and broken world. Let's volunteer and say, here I am, God. Send me. 
Amen. Friends, as we listen to the sweet strains of our offertory anthem, I'd like to invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer. We give thanks to you, O oh God. We are thankful for your steadfast love. And we praise you this day with singing and prayer, and we praise you most in service. This offering is a worshipful moment of praise, an intentional opportunity to practice hospitality and generosity. So we pray that these gifts may help our church to fulfill its purpose, and even more that we pray that you invite us to use our talents in humble ways to help our church fulfill its wider mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day and for the gift of life. We thank you for being our foundation, for supporting us, for anchoring us, for nourishing us. We thank you for all the blessings of our lives, for the communities that support and sustain us, and for the communities that manifest images of you, of love and compassion and hope. Merciful God, forgive us when we fall short. Pick us up, sustain us and guide us when we fear. Embrace us when we cry and laugh with us in our joy. Be present with your people, Lord, in places of faithful waiting waiting for encouraging news, waiting for hope to overcome despair. Be present with your people in the rush of wind where peace is fragile and justice is hard to glimpse.
compassionate one. We ask that you be with those right now who need you most. For all those who are struggling with food and housing and economic insecurity. For all those who are struggling with grief or fear, with anxiety or depression, with loneliness or hopelessness. Be with your people, Lord, as we grieve yet another horrific mass shooting. And we ask how long, O oh Lord, how long will your people suffer from senseless gun violence? And we pray with and for all the victims and survivors of all forms of violence. And we recommit ourselves to the work of nonviolence ever more fully. Hear our continued prayers, O oh Lord, for a world that remains in a state of crisis from COVID-19 and for a swift and just distribution of this life-saving vaccine globally. God, we continue to lift up prayers of deep joy and thanksgiving as we move through a period of reunion and reunification. As we move through new celebrations and new transitions and graduations and a new season of leadership in our church and a new season of reopening and a new chapter in our life together. Be present with us, God, as the ordinary is transformed into the extraordinary, the familiar into the unexplainable, so that those who witness it may recognize your power at work. God of grace and God of glory, lead us into your truth. Help us, each and every one of us in all walks of life, to hold before us a vision of your love. Help us all to love as you love. Give us your eyes and your heart. Help us to be your hands and to mend the broken places. We ask all this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.